Ashley Brock reading Nora Roberts' book, Inner Harbor, Chapter 12. It's easier now, almost like a lecture. Since Spill was used to giving lectures on social topics, all she had to do was divorce herself from the subject, lay information in a clear and cohesive manner. Professor Quinn had a relationship with Barbara Harrow. She began. She put her back to the window so that she could face all of them as she spoke. They met at an American University in Washington. I don't have a great many of the details, but what I do know it indicates that he was a teacher there and she was a graduate student. Barbara Harrow is my mother. Glory, his mother. My father feels that like your mother. Yes, nearly 35 years ago. Seems they were attracted to each other physically, at least. My mother, it's clear, sir. My mother indicated that she believed he had a great deal of potential, that he would rise up the ranks in academia quickly. Status is a central requirement to my mother's contentment. However, she found herself disappointed in his. What she saw as his lack of ambition, he was content to teach. Apparently, he wasn't practically interested in the social obligations that are necessary for advancement, and his politics were too liberal for her tastes. <laughs> she wanted a rich, important husband. Q and, and quickly filled Prince's eyeballs, and she discovered he wasn't going to be it. That's essentially true, Sibyl agreed in a cool, steady voice. Thirty-five years ago... The country was experiencing unrest, its own internal war between youth and establishment. College was teeming with minds that questioned not only an unpopular war, but the status quo. Professor Quinn is, would seem had a lot of questions. He believed in using the brain, came under, and in taking a stand. According to my mother, he took stands. Seville managed a small smile. Often unpopular with the administration of the university, he and my mother disagreed strongly on basic principles and beliefs. At the end of the term, she went home to Boston, disillusioned, angry, and she was discovered pregnant. Bullshit. Sorry. Can't say truly when Anna hits that. But it's bullshit. There's no way he would have ignored the responsibility for a kid. No way in hell. She never told him. Seville folded her hands as all eyes swung back. She was furious. Perhaps she was frightened as well, but she was furious to find herself pregnant by a man she decided was unsuitable. She considered terminating the pregnancy. She met my father, and they had clicked. It was suitable, came concluded. I believe they suited each other. Her voice chilled. They were parents today, but she had to, left. She had to be left with something. My mother was in a difficult and frightening position. She wasn't a child. She was nearly 25, but an unwanted and unplanned pregnancy is a wretching episode for a woman of any age. In a moment of weakness or despair, she confessed all of it to my father, and he offered her marriage. He loved her, so Bill said quietly. He must have loved her very much. They were married quickly and quietly. She never went back to Washington. She never looked back. Dad never knew he had a daughter. He even covered Grace's hand with his. No, he couldn't have. Gloria was three, nearly four, when I was born. I can't say what the relationship between her and my parents was like in those early years. I know that later on she felt excluded. She was difficult and temperamental demanding. Certainly she was wild. Certain standards of behavior were expected and she refused to meet them. It sounded so cold. Some people thought now. So nearly. In any case, she left home when she was still a teenager. Later, I discovered that both my parents and myself sent her money independently of each other. She would contact one of us and plead, demand, threaten, whichever worked. I wasn't aware of any of this until Gloria called me last month about Seth. So paused a moment until she could pose her thoughts. Before I came here, I flew to Paris to see my parents. Parents, I felt they needed to know Seth was their grandchild, and as far as I knew, he'd been taken away from Gloria and was living with strangers. I told my mother what had happened, and she refused to become involved to offer any assistance. I was stunned and angry. We argued. So Bill let a short laugh. She was surprised enough by that, I think, to tell me what I've just told you. Gloria had to know, Phil pointed out, she had to know Ray Quinn was her father or she'd never have come here. Yes, yeah, she knew. A couple of years ago, she went to my mother when my parents were staying in D.C. for a few months. I can assume it was an ugly scene from what my mother told me. Gloria demanded a large sum of money or she go to the press to the police. Whoever would listen accused my father of sexual abuse. My mother of... Collusion in it. None of that is true. So was a really. Gloria's always. Gloria always equated sex with power, and acceptance. She routinely accused men, partially, men and particularly men in positions of authority, of molesting her. 
In this instant, my mother gave her several thousand dollars in the story I just told you. She promised Gloria that it was the last penny she would ever send from her, the last word she would ever speak to her. My mother rarely, very rarely, goes back on a promise of any kind. Gloria would have known that. So she hit on Ray Quinn instead. Philip concluded. I don't know when she decided to find him. It may have stewed in her mind for a time. Now she would consider this the reason she was never loved, never wanted, never accepted as she felt she deserved to be. I imagine she blamed her father for that. Someone else is always to blame when Gloria has difficulties. So she found him, Philip rose from his chair to pace, and true, true to form demanded money, made accusations threatened. Only this time she used her own son as a hammer. Apparently, I'm sorry. I should have realized you weren't aware of all the facts. I suppose I assumed your father had told you more of it. He didn't have time. Kim's voice was cold and bitter. He told me he was waiting for some information. You remember that he'd explain everything once he found out. You must have tried contacting your mother, Philip Penn, Sibyl, with a look. He would have wanted to speak with her to know. I can't tell you that. I simply don't know. I know, Philip said short. He would have done what he felt was right for Seth first because he's a child, but he would have wanted to help Gloria. To that, he needed to talk to her mother, find out what had happened. It would have mattered to him. I can only tell you what I know or what's been told to me. Seville lifted her hands. Let them. My family has behaved badly. It was weak, she knew. All of us, she said to Seth. Apologize for myself and for them. I don't expect you to. What? She wondered. <laughs> and let it go. I'll do anything I can to help. I want people to know. It says arms swore him when, swore him when he lifted them to her face. I want people to know he was my grandfather. They're saying things about him and it's wrong. I want people to know I'm a Quinn. Seville could only nod. If this was all he asked for of her, she would make certain she gave it. They're on her breast. She looked at Anna. What can I do? You've made a good start already. Anna glanced at her watch. She had other cases and another appointment scheduled in a few minutes. Are you willing to make the information you've given us official and public? Yes. I have an idea how to start the ball rolling. The embarrassment factor couldn't be weighed, so Bill reminded herself. She could and would live with the whispers and the speculation of looks that were bound to come here way once she followed through on Anna's suggestion. She typed up her statement herself, spent two hours in her room choosing the right words and phrasing. The information had to be clear. The details of her mother's actions of Gloria's, even her own. When it was proofed and printed out, she didn't hesitate. She took the pages down to the front desk and calmly requested that they be faxed to Anna's office. I'll need the original back, she told her, and I expect to reply by return of fax. I'll take care of this for you. The young fresh face clerk smiled professionally, for she slipped into the office behind the desk. So Pill closed her eyes briefly, and no turning back now, she reminded herself. She folded her hands, composed her features, and waited. It didn't take long, and there was no mistaking from the wide eye of the clerk that at least part of the transmission had been scanned. Do you want to wait for the reply, Dr. Griffin? Yes, thank you. So Pill held out a hand for the papers. Nearly smiled as the clerk jolted, then quickly passed them across the desk. Are you, uh, enjoying your stay? Can't wait to pass on what you read, can you? Spill thought. Typically and totally expected human behavior. It's been an interesting experience so far. Well, excuse me a moment. The clerk dashed into the back room again. Silva was releasing a sigh when her shoulders tensed. She knew Philip was behind her before she turned to face. I sent the fax to Anna. She said simply, I'm waiting for her reply. If she finds it satisfactory, I'll have time to go to the bank before it closes and have the document notarized. I gave my word. I'm not here as a guard dog, so Bill, I thought you could use a little more support. She all but sniffed. I'm perfectly fine. No, you're not. To prove it to both of them, he rested a hand on the rigid cords in her neck. But you put on a hell of a show. But you put on a hell of a show. Prefer to do this alone. Well, you can't always get what you want, as the song says. He glanced over with an easy smile. His hand slid on, still on Sibyl's nap. As the clerk hurried out with the envelope. Hi there, Karen. How's it going? The clerk blushed clear to the hairline. Her eyes darted from his face to Sibyl's. Fine, um, here's your fax, Dr. Quinn. Thank you. Without flinching, Sibyl took the envelope and tucked it in her bag. You're bill my account for the service? Yes, of course. See you. See you around, Karen. Smoothly, Philip slid his hand from Sibyl's neck to smile her back to guide her across the lobby. She'll have to tell her six best friends by the next break, Sibyl murmured. <laughs> At the very least, the wonders of small town. The Quins will be the hot topic of discussion over a number of dinner tables tonight. By breakfast, the Gopas mill will be in full swing. 
that abuses you, said Bill Isop. It reassures me, Dr. Griffin. Traditions are meant to reassure. I spoke to our lawyer. He continued as they crossed the waterfront. Gold swooped, dodging a water boat on its way to dock. The notarized statement will help, but he'll like to take your deposition early next week if you can manage it. I'll make an appointment. In front of the bank, she stopped and turned toward him. He changed into casual clothes, and the wind off. The water ruffled his hair. His eyes were concealed behind shaded lenses, but she wasn't certain she cared to see the expression in them. I might look less as if I'm under house arrest if I go in alone. He merely lifted his hands, palms out, and stepped back. She was a tough nut, he decided, when she showed him the bank, but he had a feeling that once cracked, there was something soft, even delicate, delectable inside. He was surprised that someone as intelligent, as highly trained in the human condition as she was, couldn't see her own distress, couldn't or wouldn't admit that there had been something lacking in her own upbringing that forced her to build walls. He nearly been fooled, he mused, into believing she was cold and distant and untouched by the messier emotions. He couldn't be sure what it was that insisted he believed differently. Maybe it was nothing more than wishful thinking, but he was determined to find out for himself, and soon. He knew that making her family secrets accessible and so informally public would be humiliating for her and perhaps painful, but she agreed without condition and was falling through without hesitation. Standards, he thought. Integrity. She had them, and he believed that she had a heart as well. Spill off her a thin smile she came back out. Well, that's the first time I've seen a notary's eyes nearly pop out of her head. I think that should. The rest of her balance table was lost as his mouth rushed to cover hers. She lifted the head to his shoulder, but her fingers only curled and the soft material of her sweater. You look like you needed it. He murmured and skimmed a hand over to me. Regardless, House Bill, we've already got them talking. Why not add them to the mystery? Their emotions were rocking, making it difficult for her to hold on to any threats of composure. I've no intentions of standing here making a spectacle of myself, so if you'll... Fine, let's go somewhere else. I've got the boat. The boat? I can't go out on the boat. I'm not dressed for it. I have work. I need to think, she told herself, but he was already pulling her to the dock. A cell will do you good. You're starting on another headache. The fresh air should help. I don't have a headache. Only the nas nasty shimmering threat of one. And I don't want to. She nearly yelped so stunned it was she when he simply plucked her off her feet and set her down on the deck. Consider yourself Shanghai, Doc. Quickly, comp competently, he freed the lines and leaped aboard. I have a feeling you haven't had nearly enough of that kind of treatment in your short, sheltered life. So he... You don't know anything about my life or what I've had. If you start that engine, I'm going to. She broke up, grinding her teeth as the motor poured. They're like, Philip, I want to go back to my hotel. Now. Hardly anybody ever says no to you, do they? He said it a cheerful. He said it cheerfully as he gave her a firm nudge on the port bench. Just sit back and enjoy the ride. So she didn't intend to leap overboard and swim back to shore. In a silky suit and Italian shoes, she folded her arms. It was his way paying her back, she supposed, by taking away her freedom of choice, asserting his will and his physical dominance. Typical! She turned her head to stare out over the light chop. She wasn't afraid of him, not physically. He had a tougher side than she originally thought, but he wouldn't hurt her, and because he cared for Seth deeply, she'd come to believe he needed her cooperation. She refused to be thrilled when he hoisted the sails. The sound of the canvases opening itself to the wind, the sight of the sun beating against the rippled white, the sudden and smooth angling of the boat meant nothing to her, she insisted. She would simply tolerate this little game of his give him no reaction. Undoubtedly, he would grow weary of her silence and in and, and, and attention and take her back. Here, you toss something making her jump. She looked down and saw the nice sunglasses that had landed neatly in her eye. Sun's fierce today, even if the temperature is cool and Indian summer is around the corner. He smiled to himself when she said nothing, only slid the sunglasses primly on her nose and continued to stare in the opposite direction. We'll need a good hard frost first, he continued conversationally. When the leaves start to turn, the shoreline near the house is a picture. Golds and scarlets get the deep blue sky behind them and the water mirror bright. That spice of fall in the air and you could start to believe there's no place else on the planet you'd ever want to be. She kept her mouth firmly shut, tightened the fold of her arms across her breast. Phil merely tucked his tongue in his cheek. Even a couple of avid urbanites like you and I can appreciate a fine fall day in the country. So his birthday's coming up. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw her head jerk around. His, her mouth trembled open. She shut it again, but this time when she turned away, 
Her shoulders were hunched defensively. Oh, she felt all right. Philip mused there was plenty of messy emotions swimming inside the cool package of hers. We thought we'd throw him a party, have some of his pals over to race hell. You already know Grace bakes a hell of a chocolate cake. We got his present taken care of, but just the other day I saw this art supplies. These art supplies in the shop in Baltimore. Now, not a kid set up a real one. Chalk, pencils, charcoal, brushes, watercolors, paper, palettes. It's a specialty shop a few blocks from my office. Somebody who knew something about art could breeze in there and pick out just the right things. He intended to do it himself, but he saw now that his instincts to tell her about it had been true. She was facing him now. And though the sun flashed off her sunglasses, he could see from the angle of her head that he had her full attention. He wouldn't want anything from me. You're not giving him enough credit. Maybe you're not giving yourself enough, I enough either. He trimmed the sails, caught the wind, and saw the instant she recognized the curve of trees along the shore. She got unsteadily to her feet. Philip, however you may feel about me right now, it can't help the situation for you to push me and set again so soon. I'm not taking you home. He scanned the yard as it passed. Says that the boatyard was coming easy. In. in any case, you need a distraction, so Bill, not a confrontation. For the record, I don't know how I feel about you at the moment. <laughs> I've told you everything I know. Yeah, I think you've given me the facts. You've told, you haven't told me how you feel, how those facts, facts affect you personally, emotionally. It isn't the issue. I'm making it an issue. We're tangled up here, Sibyl, whether we like it or not. Seth's your nephew, and he's mine. My father and your mother had an affair, and we're about to. No, she said def definitely. We're not. He turned his head long enough to shoot her a glittering look. You know better than that. You're in my system, and I know when a woman's got me in hers. And we're both old enough to control our more basic urges. He stared at her another moment, then laughed. Oh, we are. That's not the sex that worries you. It's the intimacy. He was hitting all the targets. It didn't anger her nearly as much as it frightened her. You don't know me. I'm beginning to, he said quietly. And I'm someone else who finishes what I start. I'm coming about. His voice was mild now. Watch the boom. She stepped out of the way, sat. She recognized the little cove where they had shared wine and pate only a week ago, she thought dully. Now so much had changed. Everything had changed. She couldn't be here with him, couldn't risk it. The idea of handling him now was absurd. absurd. Still, she could do nothing but try. Coolly, she eyed him. Casually, she smoothed her hand over the sophisticated twists the wind had disordered. Ca cautiously, she smiled. What? No wine this time? No music? No neat gourmet lunch? <laughs> he dropped the sail, secured the boat. You're scared. You're arrogant, and you don't worry me. Now you're lying. While the boat swayed gently underfoot, he stepped forward and took the sunglasses from him. I'll worry you quite a bit. Keep thinking you have me pegged. Then I fo don't follow the script. I imagine most of the men you've let hover around your life have been fairly predictable, easier for you. If... Is this your definition of a distraction, you got it? If it's my definition of a confrontation. You're right. He put his own some glasses off, tossed them aside. Well, on his lies later. He moved quickly. She knew he was capable of lightning motion, but hadn't expected him to snap from cynic to lover. In the blink of an eye, his mouth was hot, hungry, and hard on hers. His hands gripped her arms, pressing her against him so that as the heat had... As the heat and the need poured out, she couldn't tell if it came from him or from herself. He'd spoken no less than the truth when he told her she was in his system. Whether she was poison or salvation didn't seem to matter. She was in there, and he couldn't stop the flow. He jerked her head back so that their lips parted, but their faces remained closed. His eyes were as golden powerful as the flare of sun. You told me you don't want me, and you won't want this. Tell me and mean it, and it stops here. I no impatient suffering he shook her so a gaze lifted his no you look at me and say it <laughs> she already lied and the lies weighed on her like lead she couldn't bear any other this will only complicate things make them more difficult unmistakably child flashed in those tiny eyes damn right i will he muttered just now i don't give a damn kiss me back he didn't mean it <laughs> she couldn't stop herself this kind of raw wicked need was new to her and left her defenseless her mouth met his just as hungry now just as desperate the low primal moan that escaped was an echo to the beat of desire between her legs she stopped thinking found herself swamped and spitting with sensuality 
sensa sensations, emotions, yearnings. The kiss roughened, teetered toward pain as his teeth scraped the nip, clutched at his hair, gasping for air, shaking with shock as that skillful mouth streaked down her throat and sent wild chills over her skin. For the first time in her life, she surrendered utterly to the physical and craved the taking, pulled out her jacket, tugging the soft silk off her shoulders and tossing it needlessly aside. He wanted flesh, the feel of it under his hands, the taste of it on his mouth. In his mouth, he yanked the slim ivory shell over her head and filled his hands with her trembling lace-covered breasts. <laughs> Her skin was warmer than the silk and somehow smoother. With one impatient flick, he opened her bra and dragged it aside and satisfied his need to taste. The sun blinded her, even with her eyes tilted shut. The strength of it pounded on her lids. She couldn't see, only feel. That busy, almost brutal mouth devoured hers. Those rough and demanding hands doing as they please. The one bird in her throat was a scream in her head. Now, now, now. Fumbling, she dragged out a sweater, finding the muscle and scars and flesh beneath as he yanked her skirt down her hips. He, her stockings ended with thin bands of stretchy lace high stretchy lace high on her thighs. Another time he might have appreciated the mix of practical and femininity, but now he was driving to possession, and he thrilled darkly at her stunned gasp when he ripped aside the thin triangle blocking him from her. Before she could draw the next breath, he plunged his fingers into her and shot her violently over the edge. She cried out, shocked, staggering at the vicious slap of heat. It slashed through without warning, sending her flying, failing. Oh, God, Philip, when her head dropped weakly on her shoulder, her body going from spring taut to limp, he spent her. He swept her off her feet and pressed her down onto one of the narrow benches. The blood was pounding in his head. His loins screamed for release, his heart hammering like a dull axe against his ribs. His breath was ragged. His vision focused on her face like a laser as he freed himself. His fingers dug into her hips as he lifted and opened them, and he plunged hard and deep so that his long, long groan melted into her. She closed around him, tight, hot glove, moved under him, a trembling, eager woman, forget the name, a breathless, aching sigh, he drove into her again and again, strong, steady strokes that she rose to meet. Her hair escaped in pins, flowed like rich mink. He buried his face in it, lost in her scent, in her heat, in the sheer, shimmering glory of a woman, aroused beyond reason. Her nails dug into his back, her cry muffled against his shoulder as she came. Her muscles clamped around him, owned him, destroyed him. It was as limp as she was, wrecked, struggling to fill his burning lungs with air. Beneath him, her body continued to quake, the aftershock of hard, satisfied sex. When his vision cleared, he could see the three pieces of her pretty business suit scattered along the deck in one black high heel. Made him grin, even as he shifted just enough to nip lightly at her shoulder. I usually try for more finesse, he said slyly. He skimmed a hand down to toy with a thin lace at the top of her stocking, experimenting with textures. Oh, you're full of surprises, Dr. Griffin. She was floating somewhere just above reality. She could see to open her eyes to move her head. What? <laughs> at the dreamy distance out of her voice, he lifted his head to study her face. Her cheeks were flushed, her mouth swollen, her hair tumbling mess. As an objective observer, I'd have to conclude you've never been ravished before. There was amusement in his tone. <clears throat> and just enough melt arrogance to snap her back to her. She opened her eyes now and saw the sleepy smile of victory in his eyes. You're heavy, she said shortly. Okay. He shifted, sat up, but pulled her up around till she straddled up. You're still wearing your stockings and one of your shoes. <laughs> he kind of began to need the muscles of her tight little butt. Christ, that's sexy. Stop it. He was pouring back a combination of embarrassment and fresh desire. Let me up. I haven't finished with you yet. He dipped his head, circling his tongue lazily around her nipple. You're so soft and warm. Tasty. He had flicking his tongue over her stiffened nipple, sucking lightly under her until her breathing tickled. Thinking, yeah, yeah, I want more. So do you. Her body arched back, beautifully fluid as he trailed his mouth up to the hammering pulse in her head. Oh, yes, yes, he wanted more. But this time, he promised, it, it'll take a little longer. On a yielding moan, she lowered her mouth to his. I guess there's time. The sun was angled low when he shifted her yet again. Her body felt golden and bruised, energized and exhausted. She had no idea she could claim such sex claim such a sexual appetite and now that she did she had a clue what she would do about it 
We have to discuss. She frowned at herself, draped an arm over her body. She was half naked and deaf from him and more confused than she ever been in her life. We, this can't continue. All right, this minute in green. Even I have my limitations. I didn't mean. This was just a diversion, as you said. Something we both apparently needed on a physical level and now. Shut up, Sibyl. He said it mildly, which got the edge of a noise. It was a hell of a lot more than a diversion and we'll discuss it to pieces later. He scooped the hair out of his eyes, studied her. She was just beginning to feel awkward. He realized how uneasy would be naked and with the situation. So he smiled. Right now, we're a mess. So there's only one thing to do before we get dressed and head in. What? Still smiling, pulled off her shoe, then scooped her up into his arms. Just this. He said it tossed her over the side. She managed one scream before she hit. What surface was furious woman with tangles of wet hair? It arrived. You son of a bitch! You idiot! I knew it. He stepped on the gull wing and laughed like a loon. I just knew you'd be gorgeous when you're angry. He dived in to join her. End of chapter 12.